Up until I decided to make this video, I'd actually never seen Twilight. It's one of those super popular movies that was really big when I was growing up, and I just never really wanted to see it. Uh, the other movies that are on this list include, but are not limited to, all of the Lion King movies, Shrek 2 and 3, and any of Pirates of the Caribbean. I have seen bits and pieces of all of those movies, though I have never seen any of them in their entirety. But I think Twilight is a little different than the rest of those movies because it kind of created a whole genre of film. You know, the sh over dramatic romance with a submissive white female and a dominant and also white male main character. I think the best example of this is Fifty Shades of Grey, and most of you probably know that it actually started out as a Twilight fan fiction. To this day, I still have no clue how they made three movies about a guy who has aggressive sex with his girlfriend because she looks like his mom. Three therapy sessions and this whole movie turns into a pile of ash. I'm getting off topic here, but Twilight was a cultural phenomenon to say the least. When it came out on November 21st, 2008, I was too young to give a shit about this movie and much too young to actually go see it in theaters. Even when the last one came out in 2011, I was too young to give a shit about it. And by the time I was old enough to be able to watch it, I couldn't be bothered. These movies have become an afterthought to me. That was until June of this year. You see, I grew up and went to high school in the historic red, white, and blue-blooded state of North Carolina, where the tea is sweet and the people are racist. But every year, I take the 10-hour drive down to go see my friends and do random shit for 10 to 14 business days and then leave. But this year, instead of doing anything actually interesting with my time, both my friend Emma and my best friend Michael's mom asked if I would review Twilight. Oh, I never taught someone how to do it. Super annoying. So, I'm at Emma, I'm at you doing like a really good job. Stop fucking <laughs> that. Now, initially, I had said no because I had intended to review something else, but we ended up still watching Twilight, and I can positively say I understand the hype. Now, by no means is this movie good. If it was between watching this movie again and getting a lobotomy, I'd rather get the Honey Sugarman treatment. I mean, even the reviews for the movie back me up on this. It was reviewed overwhelmingly negative, but they made four more of these because they made a shit ton of money and they were relatively easy to produce. They had been able to make a movie every year for five years straight. I don't think you guys know how ridiculous that is. These things didn't even get diminishing returns either. Each one cost more money and then profited more money than the one that came before it. In total, they pulled in over $3 billion before calling it quits on these movies. But even though supposedly there's more to the story in the books, they ended the movies here because they figured they didn't need to tell any more of the story. Good for them because some franchises go on for way too long. Although I don't think a lot of people really liked these films, I will say it's pretty easy to see the charm in them but it's pretty hard to explain, so I'll just show you what I mean. Twilight opens up to quite the start when we get a deer being chased around the forest by an unnamed grown-ass man. They don't give us any clear shots, but can you imagine how stupid you'd look chasing a deer around a forest? It's probably a lot less sexy and cool than this movie makes you think it would be. This entire opening happens with our main character giving us a melodramatic narration in the background. This is Bella Swan, played by Kristen Stewart. Bella is going to live with her father in the mysterious town of Forks, Washington. Bella's biological mother is leaving their hometown in Phoenix, Arizona, so that she can travel the world with her new boyfriend, who is a minor league baseball player. Now that seems pretty irresponsible to uproot your daughter's life so you can give your new boyfriend some roadhead, but all right. This is Bella's biological father, Charlie, the chief of police for Forks, Washington. Charlie puts the Chad into dad assuming you use two Ds to spell the word Chad. Although he and Bella are a bit estranged, he tries his best and that's all we can ask. Also, he's a dilf, f you, I like the mustache. This is Jacob. Yes, he's the werewolf guy, but just to save you the disappointment that I had when I watched this movie with my friends, Jacob doesn't do the werewolf thing in this movie. I was a little upset that I didn't get to see him turn into a furry, but if I end up watching the future movies, at least I have something to look forward to. Jacob fixed Bella's car with his father, Billy Black. When I first watched this movie, I thought that Billy and Charlie were an item, and then I remembered two men can be friends without also being gay. Though I gotta say, the utter lack of homoeroticism was something else that also provided me with a heaping helping of disappointment, so I gotta say, the black family is not making good first impressions. This is Bella's first day at school, where she gets to meet all of her future friends. Such as this twink. His name is Eric. Disregarding his leafy is here haircut, he tries to be a good friend to Bella, but he also hits on her pretty much any time he's within three cubic yards of her, so it makes me kind of want to deck him in the face just a little bit, you know? During gym class, we're also introduced to Mike and Jessica. 
They're of minor importance, so they'll have to share a name card. These two quickly also becomes friends with Bella. After this dickhead kisses Bella on the cheek to piss off Mike, we also get to meet Angela. She's a photographer for the school newspaper that Leafy also works on. Okay, here's what I don't understand. Firstly, why does everyone in the school know who Bella is? She has not introduced herself to a singular person. They all just go up to her and be like, oh, you're Bella, right? Like, yeah, sure, it's a small town and word travels fast and whatnot, but wouldn't that require these people to know everyone else and they only know her through the process of elimination? And the town can't be that small, right? Because Jacob does go to another school, apparently not too far from here. I mean, when the movie came out, the town had a population of a little over 3,000, so I guess it's not that unlikely, but I did still find it odd. And secondly, I actually don't, I don't have a second point. So here are the Cullens. Nothing really happens in this scene, they just show the Cullens and then describe them each for about 5 to 8 seconds, but that's my job, so I'm gonna wait until later to introduce them all, but just keep in mind that these people do exist. But this is the most important member of the Cullen family, Edward Cullen, played by Batman. Edward is hot? I mean, like, he's a physically attractive guy, but, but this guy... I mean, he loves to stare, especially at Bella. Probably because she's also hot, or because she smells bad. It, uh, their relationship is complicated. Throughout this whole movie, Bella also calls her mom sometimes. You can pretty much ignore these scenes, though I'll reference them when they come up. Why does bro ride to school like this? My man is just standing up in a jeep like he's going to the middle of a f***ing war zone. Nigga, it's high school. While the kids are at school, we get our first vampire attack. But because this isn't the hit 2018 movie Morbius and people don't think that vampires exist, everyone in the movie just thinks it's an animal attack. Edward comes back to class the next week, and they waste no time at all getting right back into the swing of more awkward staring in the school that only teaches biology. Well, biology and gym class? And I, I guess lunch is their elective, I don't know. This is the first time they talk to each other while they look at some onion root tip cells. God, I cannot tell what this movie likes more. Using the iPhone's dramatic cool video filter or shooting all of their conversations like six inches away from the characters' faces. I mean, Jesus Christ, at least lube me up before you f*** me with your eyes like this. Although the amount of teen angst and hairspray that Edward uses pisses me off, I respect his ability to leave a conversation whenever the hell he wants to. In this next scene, this happens. I don't know why this guy is driving like a jackass through a parking lot or why he sucks at stopping his car, but Edward stops the car with his hand, leaving everyone in the area confused as to why Bella isn't splattered across her car door like a f***ing looney tune. After being taken to the hospital, we get to meet Dr. Cullen, who is Edward's dad. Once again, this movie doesn't really seem to like fleshing out the characters as soon as we meet them, but if you guessed that this guy was a vampire, you'd be correct. I know, shockingly, the blonde pale guy in a Twilight movie is a vampire. This movie would be a lot shorter if anybody decided to actually interview Edward, though. Edward stops the car with his hand, and Bella never lies about the fact that he was there. She does lie about the fact that he stopped the car with his big, strong vampire hands, but not the fact that he was there. And no one checks on this guy or what he did. Love Charlie, respect the homie, but he is not thoroughly doing his job as police chief right now. Also, the guy who almost killed Bella is the dickhead who kissed her on the cheek like six minutes into the movie, so this guy is 0 for 2 right now. One of my favorite aspects of this movie is how good at gaslighting Edward is. When Bella runs into Edward in the hospital, he just calls her crazy and continues to participate in his favorite pastime, walking away from unfinished conversations. Later that night, this happens. And although it's mostly never addressed until later in this movie, the movie does say this. That was the first night I dreamt of Edward Cullen. That implies that she will do it more, and that it's normal. Do people do this? Have any of you ever got so infatuated with someone at your school that you dream about them constantly? The only time I've ever consistently dreamed about someone was after one of the worst breakups in my life, and I wouldn't exactly describe those dreams as being lovely. God, these guys need to start competing in professional staring contests because it's all they ever do. The next morning, the class takes a field trip to a greenhouse. You know, I really appreciate how much of a dick Edward is to Bella. <laughs> you at least watch where you walk. This is a man who knows how to treat a woman. And of course, we can't have a scene with Edward and naturally. 
This guy always walks away like he has somewhere to be, but he literally comes to talk to Bella 14 seconds later in the movie. Though to be fair, the conversation does boil down to, leave me the f alone, loser. I know what you're thinking, and it might come across as counterintuitive to keep talking to someone you want to stay away from you, and that's because it is. Not that it matters, because he comes to talk to her the next day about how he still doesn't want to talk to her. I think Edward is like the best example of flirting versus harassment. I want you to imagine the least attractive person you know constantly coming up to you and telling you to f off every single day. If it were me, I'd call the cops after like the second or third time, but because Edward is hot, he gets away with doing this for a relatively long amount of time, which is to say, at all. Edward and Bella talk and decide to hang out at the beach the next day, since Bella's friends asked her to hang out there and Bella needs an excuse to be around Edward. Another thing I can't decide if I love or hate about Edward and Bella's relationship is that these two talk like they're toxic exes, but I mean, holy f they're not even dating. In hell, they're not even friends! The next day rolls around and because Forks, Washington is a small town, Jacob is also at the beach. This is where we start dipping our toes into the lore of the Twilight universe, where we learn that the Cullens actually hate the Blacks. Uh, that sounds racist when I say it that way, but that's, it's just their last name. There's nothing I can do about that one. Supposedly the Blacks are descendants of werewolves, but Jacob's story ends with him saying, of course it's not true, Bella. Okay, nigga, then why the f did you say any of this? Like you just brought that up for no reason that had nothing to do with anything. This is the definition of a scene that kinda just happens. There is no real rhyme or reason because immediately after this scene, Bella goes straight back home anyway. Why did this scene need to happen at the beach? Was that the only place where they could shoehorn Jacob into the story? Edward didn't show up anyway. But who cares about that? Let's go dress shopping! Or not, because Bella sneaks away to go buy a book. You know what they say about girls born after 1993? Always on they book. While walking to the restaurant she's supposed to meet up with her friends at, she gets cornered by these four f wads who are looking to do less than ideal things to her. But thank God, Edward's Bella sense starts tingling and he comes to the rescue in his f Volvo. Not making fun of the car itself, but I am making fun of the fact that they managed to sneak in a bit of advertisement shot here. But this is Edward we're talking about. So rather than beat these guys up, which he's very capable of, he just leaves. Everyone knows the main vampire powers, super strength, super speed, and the power to make an exit that looks a lot more dramatic in your head than it actually is. Edward takes Bella back to the restaurant and her friends are initially upset with her for not making it to dinner, but then they're very happy when they find out that she spent her time getting by Edward Cullen. So Edward, the guy who told Bella to f off like three scenes ago, takes her out to dinner while Jessica and Angela head home. During dinner, Edward reveals to Bella that he possesses the ability to read minds. And he doesn't mince words about it either, he just straight up tells her, I can read everyone's mind apart from yours. Though he doesn't know why he can't read Bella's mind. The movie never says officially why he can't read Bella's mind. Maybe it's because she's like too pure or something, but I propose an alternate theory. What if she's just dumb? What if Bella quite literally has nothing rolling around up there and it's just 10 hours of straight silence slowed plus reverb playing on repeat? Bella's reaction to finding out that Edward can read minds is, well, she doesn't really have one. That's kind of how this whole movie has gone though. Bella sees Edward and he does something weird. She barely presses him about it. He barely answers her question, rinse and repeat. I guess if I'm being honest, it's probably not that bad if you can boil your relationship down to a formula like that. It would probably make things pretty easy. So unsurprisingly, Bella doesn't question Edward much further and Edward drives Bella back home. But while on their way back to Bella's Mojo Doja Casa house, they drive past the police station. Bella sees her dad's car still at the police station, which worries her as he should be back home by this hour. Well, yeah, but so should you. I mean, he's the chief of police, this can't be that abnormal. But after stopping by, Bella and Edward learn that there's been another animal attack. And by another animal attack, I mean another evil hot vampire attack. Honestly, if these three tried to attack me, I'd just let them have me. Uh, this guy last though, but definitely this guy first. When Bella gets back home, she reads exactly one page of her book and then Googles everything else anyway. Well, that was a waste of money. You could have bought at least 2,000 V-Bucks with that. However, after reaching the forbidden second page of Google, Bella begins to piece together that Edward is actually a vampire. So to confront Edward about this theory, Bella goes into the forest alone with the man who could launch her into the side of a cliff like a Jericho missile. This is probably the scene that most people think of when they think of Twilight. 
Edward and Bella argue for a short while, while the camera spins and there's a lot of super iconic dialogue that I'm not even gonna bother trying to play because copyright is a bitch, but the camera spinning and shaking at the same time is gonna make me f throw up. Stop that. Edward picks up Bella, runs her to the top of the mountain so he can stand in the sunlight and reveal that he unironically glistens in sunlight. Why is Edward being so dramatic? He's saying it like this is some curse. Dude, you are literally shining bright like a diamond in the sky. I would take having skin like this over being a black guy and a dark room and then everyone's saying, oh, where did Key go? It's so dark. But no, he hates his skin because it's the skin of a killer. Nigga, this is the skin of a drag queen, F off. He explains that he's designed to kill because being hot makes people wanna be near him, I guess. Like, yeah, sure, you're hot, but you have the personality of a lukewarm Pop-Tart. I wouldn't be your friend even if you asked me to. I mean, I'd probably let him hit, but like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be his friend. You know, I think I'm starting to get why people like this movie now. It's like a drug to me. You're like my own personal brand of heroin. Like, it's cheesy, but if my partner said this to me, I'd be naked under a tree with my dick gift-wrapped in like five seconds flat. Edward goes on to explain that even though the Colons only drink animal blood now, something about Bella makes him hungry for human blood. And Bella explains that she doesn't care and she just wants to be around him. I don't understand why Bella gives a f about Edward, but if I had to take a guess, it's because she has an avoidant attachment style and this is probably the sh that she gets off on. It makes sense for Edward to be attracted to Bella because her blood is like so pure that he just can't resist. But what does Bella see in this guy? He saved her life twice, yeah sure, but I want to make it known that the prerequisite for the second time that he saved her life was that Edward was already stalking her. That is not normal! This is the most normal thing that these two have done together so far. And what they're currently doing is skipping school to lie in the grass in the middle of a forest and stare at each other for a really long time. I mean, God, this scene lasts forever. The next morning during a voiceover, Bella admits that after a long, hot and heavy staring session, she has finally and officially fallen in love with Edward. They pull up to school the next day as the new hot couple on the block and everyone is staring at them and I have no clue why. Supposedly a colon being seen with anybody outside of their family is really odd, but like, is this this big of a deal? Like everyone has to give a shit about this? Maybe it's that small town shit that I just don't understand, but not once in my entire high school career did I see a couple and give a singular about them. I would probably just wish upon their downfall and continue on my way to civics class. Anyway, an undisclosed amount of time after pulling up to school, uh, genuinely, I have no clue when this happens because they're seen walking to school directly before this, but Edward begins to give his lore to Bella. Edward has been a vampire since the year 1918. He was bitten by Carlisle when he was sick with the Spanish influenza and it was the only way to save his life. So Edward has been 17 for 90 years now making him the whopping age of 107 years old. Honestly, I don't know why I expect it better from Twilight, but this does mean that they pulled the looks older than they actually are trope. Wait, does this make Edward a, a pedophile? I mean, like, he's not, like, really a creepy old man, but, like, mentally, this nigga is a lot closer to my dad than he is to me, right? Okay, I'm getting sidetracked. And after biting his wife, Carlisle and company became vegan vampires. That's the movie's term for it, by the way, not mine. They only drink the blood of animals, not humans. It's also stated that Edward is the only vampire that can read minds and his sister can see the future. I would tell you more about that, but the movie didn't really have much more to share. Just keep in mind that other vampires have their own little special abilities, though I think those are the only two that matter in this movie. The next day, Edward takes Bella to meet his family. I feel like this has to be a bad idea, but it's a movie and I'm just here for the ride. These are the Cullens. They're as dysfunctional as they are attractive. The only other one that's really important to reference outside of the dad is Alice. I think, I think I just fell in love with her. Like I said, like her dad, she's the only one important enough to even bother earning a title card. I will say though, uh, shout out to this guy. His name is Jasper and he is a newly vegan vampire and it makes him look like he is tweaking 24 seven. We get to see Edward's room and oh my God, this is nice. Girl, this you? Oh, okay. It's comprised of about 70 books and 400 different music albums. None of them are by Kendrick Lamar, so I don't care. This is the first and only thing that Edward and Bella have in common. They like music. You guys are really trying to write a five-star meal out of a Big Mac here. They begin to dance and Bella admits that she doesn't know how to dance, so Edward kills her. Nah, I'm kidding. They just do this. I can't say that this wouldn't be fun, but I can't say that it doesn't look stupid either. 
Later that day, or week, or night, it's not exactly clear, but Edward makes his way into Bella's room during the night, where he reveals that he has been sneaking into a room every night for the past couple of months for the simple purpose of watching her sleep. He says he does this because he finds it fascinating. I do not know how this kind of works on Bella, but if he was 15% uglier, he would be behind bars with the kind of stunts that he pulls. So if you remember earlier in the movie when Bella said that she had been dreaming of Edward, nope, it wasn't that. It was just that he was genuinely in her room most nights watching her sleep, staring deep into her soul as she does nothing but lay there and breathe. Bella is attracted to this predator type Riz, and things begin to get hot and heavy, but this movie is PG-13, so he pulls back and says he doesn't want to lose control. That is literally Edward saying, I don't want to f*** you, because if I did, I would literally kill you. The next morning, Bella introduces Edward to her dad, and Edward tells Charlie that Bella will be playing baseball with the Cullen family that afternoon. Charlie initially doesn't believe this because Bella is less active than Threads after the first week, but he ultimately lets her go anyway. This is actually one of the coolest scenes in the movie, and I enjoy it quite a lot. It's kind of fun to watch vampires let loose on something as rudimentary as baseball and make it into a lot more of a performance. Also, Supermassive Black Hole is playing in the background of the scene, and it makes it go pretty hard. I've been listening to this song for years and didn't know it was popularized by this movie, and now every time I listen to it, I'm gonna think of Robert Pattinson. Thanks, movie. However, the fun is cut short when the sexy vampires show up to face off against the beautiful vampires. This is Laurent, Victoria, and James, but I like to call them the Thirsty Three, both because they drink blood and because they exude an insane amount of raw sexual energy. Laurent explains that they meant no trouble or harm to the Cullens, as they didn't know that this was the turf of other vampires. So they squash the non-existent beef that they have, but just as they're about to leave, James gets a whiff of that good old human stank and wants nothing more than to kill Bella where she stands. Victoria seems to want to back her man up, but Laurent doesn't want to deal with all those white people, so he tells them to back off. However, it becomes clear to everyone that James isn't going to back down just because Daddy tells him to. Edward explains that James's hunt for Bella has now begun, and his hunt won't end until he sucks her dry like a middle schooler to a Kool-Aid packet. It's stated that vampires like James don't back off once they've acquired a target, and James will hunt Bella until he gets his meal. Honestly, I've never had that much dedication to any one thing in my life. I do have one little silly question for James though, why not just go kill, I don't know, anyone else? Edward does say that he just really likes the hunt, but does James not realize that he'd have to go through an entire family of vampires just to get to one singular white chick? Bro, you are in the middle of Forks f***ing Washington. You can find 15 people just like her on any given sidewalk. Bella has to lie to her dad to save his life and lead James away from the house telling him that he's the reason that she wants to leave Forks. This is honestly a pretty heartbreaking scene. I wasn't kidding when I said that dad is a great person earlier. He's passionate, caring, loving, and understanding. And Bella has to lie to him and tear apart his world just to save his life. This movie may not be my favorite thing ever, but props where props is due, they wrote the f*** out of that interaction. The Cullens take Bella back to their house where they find Laurent bearing a warning for them. That warning basically boils down to, James is going to kill you. Good luck, LOL and he promptly takes his leave. So the Cullens get ready to fight to the death against James and Victoria. I mean, they get thoroughly prepped to gang stomp a hoe. They do specify that James and Victoria are more than able to fend for themselves, but I mean, this is a 7v2 that they're about to run. Even if they're strong, I'm not sure they stand much of a chance. Half of the Cullens go to distract James while Alice and Jasper take Bella to the Hilton Hotel back in Phoenix. Good thing they took her to a Hilton. Can you imagine you were being this stressed out and someone took you to a Marriott? God, I can't even imagine. Bella's luxury comfort, free room service, and complimentary continental breakfast don't last long, as James runs all the way to Phoenix, Arizona, and then kidnaps Bella's mom and tells Bella to meet him at Bella's old ballet studio. Once again, this seems like much more effort than it's worth, right? Bro would rather run 1,500 miles to kidnap one person's mother than just kill anybody else with type O negative blood. Come to think of it, why don't they just rob blood banks? Sure, maybe they want their blood warm, but that's something a microwave and a bowl can't fix. 
James also makes Bella travel all the way to the studio just to meet up with her. He calls Bella, so wouldn't it have saved both of you a lot of time if he just said, tell me where you are and your mother lives? Like, yeah, sure, he's trying to get her away from the Cullens, but let's see how long that lasts. But they did say he's a tracker and not a planner. Bella makes her way into the ballet studio and is immediately ambushed by James, who decides to make a creepy recording to further piss off Edward. But because Bella is a fighter, she does a really stupid thing and tries to use pepper spray on a vampire. Really? I'm honestly personally a little insulted that you even tried that shit. Because Edward is faster than the other Cullens, he manages to track down Bella and fights off James, but not before James manages to grab a quick bite of Bella. James's punishment for biting Bella is having his neck broken and being set on fire. Holy f I I'm not saying he didn't deserve that, but I am saying holy f to make Bella not turn into a vampire, Edward has to suck James's venom out of her body. That sounds a lot more vulgar than it is, and it also sounds like it wouldn't f work. But the only part of sucking venom out of Bella that is actually hard is that he'll need the willpower to not suck out Bella's blood. Which supposedly sounds a lot easier than it is, but we just get a lot of flashbacks from earlier in the movie and then Bella wakes up in a hospital bed, so maybe it wasn't that hard anyway. The story that they end up giving the cops in the hospital and whoever else asks is that Bella fell down a flight of stairs, which broke her leg. Bella then fell through a window, which gave her a nice little stab wound in her thigh. Personally, I think that's hilarious. Not that she got injured, but the fact that anybody f bought this sh I mean, hey, it's a better explanation than I was the primary target of a vampire attack. Oh, by the way, Victoria, the explanation for where she is during all this is she ran off. Then why even make her a threat at this point? She should have just been on Laurent's side. She didn't do anything. Edward decides it's best that Bella leaves with her mom when her mom moves to Jacksonville, because all of this happened because of him, which is actually very true. Remember the three times he said, I think I should leave you alone, and then he just didn't? As much as I want to pin some of the blame on Bella, she never really engaged with Edward until he kept bothering her, telling her to leave him alone. I'm sorry, that's so stupid. She was already leaving you alone. Why did you keep talking to her if you wanted her to leave you alone? It's prom day and Bella looks beautiful. Bella runs into Jacob, who is paid by his father to tell Bella to break up with Edward. I get that this is sequel bait, but really? Really? In the context of the movie itself, it's not a particularly interesting scene. Also, it's weird as f you're a grown ass man who just paid money for a 17 year old girl to break up with her boyfriend. You need to have a long, hard look at yourself in the mirror, Mr. Black. Bella and Edward make their way into the prom where they have their cute little fairy light dance to themselves since all the extras decide to leave since the main characters are here now. Bella thinks she's ready to become a vampire, but Edward tells her, yeah, you don't want to do that, chief, and edges the f out of her. But after a little more Victoria Brand sequel bait, our movie finally comes to an end. I think I only have two massive gripes with this film. Firstly, the movie is unbelievably cheesy. But if we're being real, this movie invented this genre of cheesy. It paved the way for stupid romance dramas where people talk slowly and take deep breaths constantly and take forever to address the fact that they have feelings for each other. So I kind of have a bit of respect for the movie for that. But my other major gripe for this film is that this movie is just, it's, it's filmed in blue. Like every single scene is color graded to be blue and it makes everything look kinda ugly. Like for certain scenes, it looks great and I like it, and I understand that Forks is supposed to be a town where the sun doesn't shine. It's why the vampires live there. But even the beach scene just looks cold and sad, and it's hard to believe that any good things can or ever will happen in a movie that just looks like it got dropped in a bottle of laundry detergent. I mean, you could have had a scene of visual spectacle during the baseball scene, with all the vampires playing baseball at 200 miles per hour where their skin is glistening. I mean, I do understand that they needed to play baseball during the thunderstorm because of the crack of the bat. So you're kind of left between a rock and a hard place with stuff like that. But come on, give us a warm filter for at least one scene in this film. Because truthfully, not only does it make the movie look worse, but it makes the editing feel lazy when the entire film is filtered with basically the same color. I also do find it mildly annoying that the Thirsty Three become major antagonists pretty much out of nowhere. Like yeah, they're established very on early into the movie, but we only see them two times before this, and then an hour and 20 minutes in, James becomes the major antagonist of the film. I don't think I even mentioned the first time they show up because it's such a moot point in the film, it doesn't matter. The movie just does not have a major antagonist for an hour and a half. 
Not to mention, this movie switches between being a romance to an action film in like, what, five minutes? So the pacing also feels really odd. The movie is still entertaining throughout this, the switch is just really jarring. They also could have made Victoria the antagonist after James is killed. She could have been a character who doesn't want to actively participate in killing Bella, but she doesn't want James to die, so she could have gone off the deep end after James's death. That would have been better than her doing virtually nothing. Also, last things about the antagonists, I swear, but isn't it funny that Laurent shows up and is like, oh, hey, my bad guys, we'll just leave. And then James smells Bella because the wind blows in his general direction, and then boom, 30 more minutes of movie. Like, dog, what? There is just no antagonist in this movie until there is, and that is the best way I can describe it. I also understand that this movie is based on what was at the time a very well-established book, and it was guaranteed to be a hit. But is it not a little odd that the movie establishes the existence of vampires and then establishes Victoria to be the main antagonist of the movie just to do nothing with either of those? It's a little annoying to the casual viewer. However, I do think that's enough complaining about the film because there are parts of this movie that I really did enjoy. Like the guitar and piano heavy score of this film is f Bang, I'm not gonna lie. I found myself very engrossed in the music that was created for this film. Does it save it from the problems that I mentioned earlier? F no, but I did like it. Bella's lullaby is a solid banger. Uh, I'm not a huge music guy, but that one part where it goes like, dun, 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 dun. Wait, what the? What the f does that mean? All I wrote in the script was dun 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 dun. That could literally be any song ever. But in the end, none of this matters because I'm just jealous of what these two have. And everything I said in this video is because I hate when other people have things that I don't, including love and compassion. So rounding it all out, I'm gonna give Twilight a 5 out of 10 on the critical score. Something that is a very large contributor to the score, but I kind of forgot to mention until now, is that this movie is really f long for no reason. It feels like they actively went out of their way to stretch out certain scenes sometimes, and it makes it very boring to watch through. But on the fun score, I'm gonna give this movie a 10 out of 10. This movie is f***ing ridiculous if you go into it knowing nothing. Hell, even if you know everything, it's still at the very least funny. Like, all these awkwardly long scenes are so f***ing funny if you watch them with friends. Twilight drinking game idea? Take a shot every time a scene lasts just a little bit longer than it should, and every time a scene goes on for more than 45 seconds without dialogue, take two shots. Uh, disclaimer, don't do that. I think you could end up with alcohol poisoning if you did that. I'm not joking, it happens a lot. Thank you guys so much for watching. Remember to follow me on my socials. Thank you guys so much for my patrons. I do want to say, I feel like it's important to note, my Patreon only goes to things that support the channel. Like, uh, currently, I record all of my videos on a stack of books with my iPhone, so my Patreon will help me buy a new camera. I, I don't use it to, like, buy Denny's or anything. Also, I do still intend to go back to featuring fan art. I'm just kind of stockpiling it a bit, so if you have any, just send it in the Discord, send it to me on Twitter or Instagram, and I will feature it. I'm just not doing it this week. Anyway, thank God that is over, and I never have to do it again. <laughs> is the lobotomy still on the table?